Good morning and good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining us um, in the US. My name is Cecile McGuire and I'm the Associate Director North America for the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Queensland. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I meet you today, the Gerbil Yogado people. I pay my respects to their ancestors and, and their descendants who continue their cultural and spiritual connections to country. I'd like to introduce my colleagues from Oxner who will be presenting today. We have Professor Ronald Amity, who is the head of our Oxner Clinical School, and Dr. Tamika Webb to teach, the Director of Admissions for the Oxner Clinical School. We're going to take turns presenting some slides to you today to give you an overview of the UQ Oxner MD program. Um, and we'll save any questions till the end. So you'll have an opportunity to, to write questions to us through the chat function and we'll, we'll answer those questions at the end of the presentation. So Dr. Amadee will be our first presenter and I'll turn it over to you now, Ron. Thank you very much, Cecile, and welcome to uh, our UQ Auctioner webinar. Um, the Doctor of Medicine program that exists in our partnership between the University of Queensland and Auctioner Health in New Orleans is designed to graduate global physicians to work toward solving tomorrow's problems, today and tomorrow's problems. This is a very unique model which allows US students to train in the best of both worlds, so to speak, in the continent of Australia and the United States, leveraging the strengths and resources of two highly respected institutions. This is indeed a four-year postgraduate full-time study program. Our match rate, since we have been participating in the, the NRMP, is right at 94%. Um, all of our graduates are eligible for ECFMG certification and com successful completion of the degree allows our graduates to practice in all 50 of the United States and also qualifies for practice in the continent of Australia. I like this particular slide because we're looking here at University of Queensland's values and the Oxner mission and we can see that these two really fit quite nicely together. Uh, what we are striving to create um, is a cohort of, of physicians that will be role models for the caregivers of the future, not only in the United States, but also abroad. A little bit about the University of Queensland. I don't know how many of you are familiar with, uh, with Australia or have visited or not, but it is located on the east coast of Australia. It is the third largest city in Australia. Uh, the largest is Sydney, second is Melbourne, and the third largest is Brisbane. Um, the state of Queensland is one of the largest states in, in Australia. Uh, by all accounts, the University of Queensland is a top 50 global university, depending on what rankings that you look at. Preeminent, uh, particularly for its research prowess. It has six distinct faculties, and what we're talking about today is the Faculty of Medicine. It also has eight research institutes and 30 plus teaching and research sites. Complement that experience in Australia with that in New Orleans at Oxner Health, which is comprised of 40 hospitals and over 100 health centers in the Deep South, primarily in the state of Louisiana and adjacent Mississippi. We have a little over 1,700 employed physicians at this time, representing over 90 medical specialties. Oxner Health is the single largest private employer in the state of Louisiana. How will the students learn? They will learn in two phases, and we'll talk a little bit about what distinguishes both of these phases, beginning with phase one. Next slide. The teaching locations in Brisbane are shown here. Um, the main uh, clinical medicine locations are in, in the urban areas of Brisbane, but they also utilize some of the rural-based clinical schools which surround Brisbane. And then, of course, the city of New Orleans and Oxnard Clinic for phase two. Next slide. Phase one is the clinical preparation years one and two, which takes place in Brisbane, Australia. Um, here, the students will study basic and clinical sciences, research, ethics, public health, and a lot more. One of the 
novel things about the experience in Brisbane is the integrated case-based learning experience, which occurs very early on in year one of phase one. Um, a lot of evidence-based and quality-driven clinical uh, skills training, access to a wide range of student support, both in Brisbane and also in New Orleans, particularly around USMLE preparation. And obviously, when you're in Brisbane, since there's a lot of research that takes place at the university, it's easy to incorporate research into the degree, medical degree requirements. Phase two takes place in New Orleans, hands-on clinical practice at the Oxford Clinical School in New Orleans for years three and four. Here, the students will benefit from a health system that has been providing high-quality patient care to the residents of Louisiana since 1942. Um, the various experiences in phase two, typical hospital practice, which incorporates medicine and surgery, women's health and mental health, um, also advanced hospital practice where we look at anesthetics experience, ICU, ophthalmology, emergency medicine, orthopedics, and other medical specialties. And then a primary care plus, general practice, medicine and society, or rural and remote medicine as an elective, usually in the fourth year. Research opportunities, again, UQ and the Oxner um, uh, uh, health system have long traditions of academic excellence and scientific discovery, and it's a novel opportunity for our students to participate in these. Students are eligible and encouraged to participate in all the research options available in the medical program to them, which includes a higher degree by research, an MPhil, and also a PhD. Tamika will now take us through the student support services that are available both in Brisbane and here in New Orleans. Tamika. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tamika Webdatij. I'm the admissions director. Our students are provided support every step of the way. Uh, we want to make sure that they get the most out of their medical studies and that they enjoy their time, their time both in Australia and at Oshner in New Orleans. So we provide them with access to both students and a network of staff. We do that through different ways. Um, one way is the medical student support services that are in Brisbane and are is available to them immediately. Uh, personal advisor network also during phase one. Um, we have the Oshner Medical Society, so um, we'll talk about how that is divided. I am a society head. We provide USMLE support, and there's also student societies, including OMSA and UQMS. <laughs> This is a picture of a uh, celebration that OMSA had. Um, OMSA is the Oshner Medical Student Association and they serve as a student advocacy organization. So they represent the students in matters uh, related to academics, research, community outreach, and social events. The OMSA uh, officers are both present in New Orleans and in Brisbane and are elected by these students. The medical societies. So in the first year, students are assigned to one of the five societies that are each led by a faculty member. The societies are named based on the founders of Oshner. And what the societies provide is uh, both educational advice and coaching. Um, also, we provide assistance when things don't go right that may not be academic, whether it's personal or family issues, anything that may impact their studies, we're there to support the students. We give them a sense of community within the larger uh, Oshner UQ cohort. So our five societies are Alton Oshner Society, Curtis Tyrone Society, Edgar, Edgar Byrne Society, Francis Lejeune Society, and Guy Caldwell. USMLE uh, support is important. So we help them with preparation. Uh, for step one, we provide the USMLE step one first aid. We also give them a subscription for the USMLE World Q Bank, Boards and Beyond as a study uh, supplement. Three uh, practice exams are provided for the students to take. And then they are also given a step one study guide that's formed um, by our Dean of Student Affairs based on the students who have performed exceptionally well on the uh, USMLE. 
for step two CK and CS preparation. They also get access to the USMLE World Q Bank for that. And they have a multitude of uh, online resources. In addition, we've added a dedicated USMLE preparation course that's in year two, semester two. And they have loads of hours of instruction uh, covering behavioral science, biochemistry, immunology, medical genetics, microbiology, pathology, pharmacology, and physiology. So how do our students perform on the USMLEs? Thus far, for our first time pass rate for step one, all of our students to date is an 87% pass rate. In 2018, we had 86% pass rate. In 2019, 91%. In 2020, we had a 90% pass rate. For step two CK, our overall students to date, we have a 91% pass rate. We had an 84 in 2018, 96 in 2019, and a 100% pass rate in 2020. For residency mentoring and advising, a great deal of this occurs within the societies. We want to make sure that each student gets individual advising. We counsel them regarding their specialties and career development. We help them connect with other mentors within the specialties that they are interested in pursuing. We give them match strategies. Uh, we go over the timelines. Um, we also perform mock interviews so they, that they can experience what an interview may be like. And we give advice on the application itself. This is all led by the Assistant Dean of Student Affairs. Uh, we also have student-driven special interest groups uh, based on specialties. And we do an annual career day just so students can get an idea of what their options are. Our residency match rate, uh, we are achieving results that are compar comparable to US medical schools. Our graduates have been able to secure residency, residencies in highly competitive programs at leading hospitals across the US. Our overall match rate, as Ron mentioned, is 94%. So, from 2013 to 2020, we have matched, again, 94% of our residents, 17% stay at Ashna, which is good for us because we know the quality of our students and are happy for them to stay. Primary care residencies, 56% uh, of our students go into primary care, and 56% of our students stay and do residencies in the Southeast, which is helpful for our community to help improve health, health disparities. Some match highlights, we've matched in pediatrics at UCL and Harbor, Oregon Health Science, Bay State Medical Center, University of Arkansas, University of Chicago. In obstetrics and gynecology, we've matched in University of Texas, Houston, University of Hawaii, Bridgeport Hospital. In internal medicine, we've matched at Ashner, University of South Florida, Oregon Health Science, and Tulane University. And surgery, we've matched at Brigham and Women's, Guthrie Robert Packer, and UCLA Harbor. For emergency medicine, we've matched at Ashner, Duke, LSU, University of Florida, University of New Mexico. And for anesthesia, we've matched at Ashner, Loma Linda, University of Arkansas, University of Buffalo, and University of Mississippi. Here you can see listed all of the different places our, resi our students have matched. Um, we've had our second uh, neurosurgery match. We had successful matches in surgery again, pathology, internal medicine, pediatrics, and anesthesiology. So we've done very well uh, in the match. Our students are matching across the United States. Um, definitely, many of our students are interested in California positions. Um, and so we've had students match there as well. 
Um, one thing that's important is making sure that our students are able to function fully function when they complete medical education with us. And so we've done surveys of the residency programs that our students have been accepted. And we had an 87% response rate. And what we saw is that our interns, our students who become interns, 35% of them rank within the first quartile of their intern class and 52% rank within the second quartile of their intern class. So this shows that we are producing quality residents, and this is exciting. So we know in the United States and the world as a whole, we face future challenges, and those include aging and what's gonna happen And the population over the age of 60 will be 2 billion. That population will have with it more medical issues. So from this uh, image that's coming up now, you can see that from age zero to 44, only about 3.3% at the most have chronic illnesses. As you go across and get into the older age groups, it increases. So by the time you get to 65 and older, 32% or more of the population will have some kind of arthritis or cardiovascular disease. We'll be dealing with more people with back pain problems and other health issues. So three-fifths of the United States adults will have a chronic condition. And the risk of having these conditions increase with age, lower socioeconomic status, and geographic remoteness. Our job is to prepare the next generation to care for these, this population. We aim to graduate doctors who are caring and compassionate, capable from the first day of work. And we see that in how well our students do it once they go into residency. Um, able to grow through their career. Our students are distinctively critical thinkers, socially accountable, and global leaders in health. So regarding critical thinking and being uh, thoughtful, our students are research literate, they're curious, they push the boundaries of knowledge in their field, they think outside of the box, and they don't accept the status quo. Regarding social accountability, our students are person-centered. They champion um, being involved in patient care. They're committed to improving disparities in their communities, and they advocate for better health systems in Australia and in, in America as well. And this is actually a picture of a student working at the Haiti clinic that is set up by one of our physicians, and the students get to travel there and provide medical care. Our students are global leaders in health. By having an experience in Australia and in the United States, it gives them the opportunity to see two health systems. They're actively engaged in improving patient care and public health. They're culturally competent and they're effective team players bringing skills in research and in innovation. Thank you very much, Ron and Tamika. I'm now going to run through some slides specifying our admissions requirements, and then we'll open it up to questions. So our, our cohort is a, quite a large cohort. We have one of the largest medical school year one classes in Australia. Um, we take 90 students into the UQ Oshner program, and, and those students are required to be US citizens or US permanent residents. In addition, we take another 280 Australian students 
they come to us through a variety of pathways. Um, some of them come into our four-year MD program, but the majority of them actually uh, have studied a, a degree at UQ um, following on from completion of year 12, and then they continue into the medicine program. Additionally, we take 100 international students, and those students can be from anywhere in the world. We take a large number of Canadians into that cohort, but also students from Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, and so on. So the students are part of a, a diverse uh, cohort of first-class medical students. Our entry requirements are fairly straightforward. We require a minimum score on the MCAT of 504. Um, our GPA minimum uh, that students need to meet is a B average, and that is cumulative in their bachelor or master's degree. We don't actually wait any courses in their degree. I know a lot of US med schools will wait science courses, but UQ considers cumulative GPA. Based on um, the MCAT and GPA requirements, students are invited to participate in the multiple mini interview. I'll talk a little bit more in a couple of slides about how um, we've addressed the issue of the cancellation and delay in the MCAT tests. Um, we've also uh, transitioned to offer all of our MMIs online, um, so students are able to complete the MMI um, virtually. At the moment, we are recruiting for the 2021 um, intake. So our academic year uh, matches the calendar year. So our program begins in late January, 2021. Um, but from 2022, applicants will be required to have successfully completed two subject prerequisites. And these will be integrative cell and tissue biology and system physiology, or the equivalent of those courses. So we're obviously very aware of the cancellation of MCAT test dates because of COVID-19 restrictions. So we wanted to make sure that those applicants weren't unfairly impacted. We've had approval to invite applicants who don't yet have an MCAT score to attend an MMI. We do require them to have confirmation of their tech test booking. So we will assess um, their application and their eligibility uh, to be invited to the MMI interview based on their, on their GPA. Following on from attendance at the MMI, we will um, issue conditional offers to students who's, who have successfully um, uh, attended the MMI interview. Um, they won't receive an unconditional offer until all admissions requirements are met. And so we would need submission of an MCAT score that meets our minimum of 504. We obviously um, have 90 places available, so it will be subject to availability of places, um, but we expect that, <coughs> excuse me, we, we will still have places available until later in the year. It's a big investment. I mean, this is a big decision, um, where to attend medical school, and we're conscious of the fact that it's a big investment in terms of time and money. So students in this program pay in US dollars, the 2020 fee is US $67,456. And the University of Queensland has just announced that it will not increase tuition fees in 2021. So this will be the, tu the tuition fee for 2021 as well. We have accreditation um, by the United States Department of Education. And so we are able to administer US financial aid loans for any eligible US students who are coming into this program. Again, our application process is very straightforward. Students apply directly to the University of Queensland. We're currently, currently accepting applications for the 2021 intake, and we've already had two offer rounds. So we um, held MMI interviews in March and May, and uh, just uh, have just issued offers for the students who attended the May MMI. Um, we're holding MMIs again later this month, and so those offers will come out approximately two weeks after the date of the MMI, so the next offer round will be in July. And you can see the other um, months that we will be holding MMIs and then issuing offers this year. 
Just wanted to share with you as well the, the cohort demographics of our most recent entering class 2020. So we had a gender balance of 50% male and 50% female. The average age of our 2020 entering class was 25 years. And the average MCAT was 509. And our average GPA for a master's degree was 3.45 on a four scale. And for a bachelor's was 3.4. That's the end of our formal presentation. I'm just going to stop um, sharing the presentation so you can come back to see our presenters. Um, I, I also wanted to mention, I, for, I forgot when we were talking about the MCAT, we've increased the, the number of years that we will accept MCAT validity. So previously it was three years and we are now accepting MCATs that are, have been written in the last four years. Just going to open up the chat now so we can see what questions have come in. So the first question, and Ron and Tamika, I'm happy to, to pass these questions on to both of you and, and both to respond. The first question is, can you share any insights on the change to pass-fail scoring for USMLE Step 1? Will it impact the residency placement of future students? Well, the other hat that I wear here with Oxner Health is that I oversee graduate medical education also. I'm the DIO here at Oxner, and I think what's going to happen is that when step one goes to pass fail, there still will be a numeric score for step two. And I think a lot of program directors will be looking at those numeric scores and see how people perform at that particular level. Um, as we all know, uh, in medical school, that, that typically grade pass or fail, there's still some numbers that are behind there. So um, I think that will be another factor that will be considered. Um, I, I, I like what has happened this year in terms of, um, I mean, I don't like the, the COVID pandemic by any means, but I think what has happened in response to it since in terms of virtual interviewing for residencies, uh, in terms of uh, really no audition type of, uh, of rotations this year, it's very nice in terms of leveling the playing field. Everybody's, everybody's coming in at the same basis. And I think for the first time in a long time, um, this is something that has long been necessary and I'm happy it's here this year and to see how this particular experiment goes this year. I have a feeling it's gonna continue well into the future. Thank you, Ron. The next question is, is it possible following this program to practice in both the US and Australia? And do you have to choose at which point during this process um, that a student would select where they want to practice? Can they apply to residencies in both countries? So our students can do residency in Australia, but the thing is, if you do a residency in Australia, you cannot practice in the US. So you have to make that decision that you want to stay in the United States, stay in Australia, or you're willing to do another residency afterwards. But they are eligible to practice in either location. And we do have some students who fall in love with Australia or someone who lives in Australia and they stay and they go ahead and they do a residency and practice there. Thank you. Um, we have a question about the prereq. Will animal comparative physiology count for the physiology prereq? I might uh, hold that question unless Ron or Tamika want to answer it. We are currently, you know, looking to come up with a, a database that advisors and students will be able to access that will show what courses would be considered the equivalent. But we, that is still a work in progress. Um, so I'll, I'll hold that question over and we'll make sure we have some updated information available that we can send to advisors. Um, the next question is about the estimated cost of attendance per year, i.e. tuition, living expenses. Um, I'm happy to talk about the Brisbane experience and then Ron and Tamika might throw it to you to talk about the New Orleans experience. So the tuition fee that I quoted in US dollars, um, just over 67,000 US dollars, that's tuition only. And students are not required to pay that all in one go. They actually pay per semester um, or in phase two when they are working their way through the clinical rotations, they pay per clinical rotation. In terms of living expenses in Brisbane, Ron mentioned that we are the third largest city in Australia, and so we're not the most expensive city. Sydney and Melbourne 
department would, would you know, have that honor. We generally advise students to budget, you know, approximately 20,000 Australian dollars a year to cover, cover living costs. So that's accommodation, you know, food, travel and so on. Now students can spend more depending on how far away from campus you want to live, how many flatmates, uh, what we call roommates, you want that sort of thing, but twenty thousand dollars is a is a good uh, benchmark. We have a great financial aid office here who works very closely with our U.S. students on calculating the cost of attendance because there are some other expenses um, for for the students in this program that that are can be covered by their U.S. financial aid. Um, I might uh, ask Roner to make it a comment on the cost of living in New Orleans. So it's, it's less expensive than in Brisbane, but also you have to remember during that second part of their education, they need to now gear up for residency interviews. Now we're going virtual, so costs may be different, but they have to be ready for that and for uh, USMLE costs to take exams. So there's still costs. We, we say pretty similar to what they would expect in Australia because of the other expenses that come up. Also, if I can comment on Australia, the majority of the students in our cohort in Australia do not own a car. I know that's a common question that we get at some of these webinars. Um, Brisbane is a very uh, outdoor city, very walkable city. Um, the river taxis are one of the most interesting ways to see the city and to get around the city. And they're also very inexpensive. There's an incredible um, uh, well-structured and cheap, reasonably priced uh, bus system that connects with all the, the major uh, uh, hotspots in the city, and particularly all the major teaching sites within the city of Brisbane. Um, I think what our students enjoy the most is the proximity to what part of the world that they are in and to avail themselves of everything that Australia has to offer them. It's a gorgeous continent. It's a beautiful, beautiful area, and being situated less than in uh, 70 minutes by air from the Great Barrier Reef and from 30 minutes from the Gold Coast, um, some of the most beautiful beaches and waters um, that you can see anywhere in the world. And a lot of our students in their free time, they're, they're visiting the continent of Australia and learning more about its people and about health care is delivered in that environment. Thank you, Ron and Tamika. And yes, I think our public transport is, is quite good in, uh, in Brisbane and students also receive a 50% discount if they show their student ID. Um, Ron's talking about the, the river ferries that we have, the city cats, large catamarans that go directly to the UQ St. Lucia campus where students study in, in phase one. Um, we have another question asking if graduates of our program are able to stay in Australia practice or must they return to the U.S. and to make a talk earlier about that option. So, um, you know, students are able to consider both options. The, the challenge to stay in Australia is, um, you know, there's not a huge number of, of internships that are available to international medical graduates. So students are provided with all that information that they need when they're in the program to help them in making the best decision for them. I have another question here. If, um, if you are a non-traditional post-bac student who is retaking MCAT this year, will the old score be accountable? Tamika, did you want to take that one? So as long as uh, it's within that four year of validity that we're using now, um, it's accountable and it needs to be a 504. Thank you. We have a question asking, um, could you speak more on student organizations, scholarly pathways of available and extracurricular opportunities, such as the Haiti program you spoke of? So our students have many, many opportunities to participate in extracurricular activities. Most of them range around uh, community service. They tend to do a lot of community service, whether it's going to Haiti, whether it's going to Monte Paul, whether it's participating in local New Orleans community outreach. They do a great deal of work. Um, they are involved in research. Not everyone does research for a degree, but they do research on their own, which is helpful just because students like to learn and it's also helpful for residency application. Um, so what else did they ask? So scholar, what was the whole thing? Was a bit uh, student organizations, scholarly pathways, extracurricular opportunities. 
So student organizations, we have a plethora of organizations that are based on specialties. And what that does is it allows students to get more insight into the specialty that they want to be uh, to go in residency for. So their interest groups. Um, we also have different organizations that focus on patient needs. So we have walk with a doc or we have students who do extra things with the phone, uh, pardon me, with the phone bank that we use for COVID-19 to assist patients. Um, we also had students do a lot with voice banking for patients who have ALS and they're going to lose their voice as the disease progresses. Their family will still have a record of what their voice was like. And so they do a lot of great things. They contribute to our community a great deal. We're 15 years after Hurricane Katrina hit the city of New Orleans, but Habitat for Humanity is quite strong in the city and is still reconstructing portions of the city that were devastated by that storm. And our students are, are frequent participants in those types of activities all throughout the city of New Orleans. On a, on a, on a more recent note, I can tell you that um, as a result of COVID, uh, when the pandemic, New Orleans is one of those cities that got hit early. Um, our first patient was admitted to an ICU at Oxner on the 9th of March, and the first death from a COVID-related um, complication occurred on the 10th. And fairly quickly, by the 10th of April, the Oxner system reached its peak where we had over 657 patients in ICUs, all COVID positive being treated for the disease. So we were hit very early, a uh, very serious impact and, and our particular students during that time uh, were not a part of any problems. They were looking for solutions of how to help us better take care of these people and most importantly, stay in communi communication with their families because we hear a lot about the disease being uh, one of social isolation when they're in ICUs and all the number of patients that have met their demise and uh, died alone. Uh, students were very involved in relaying a lot of information to the patient's families. They were directly involved in that. Uh, another thing that the students did was they created a, an additional phone bank for Oxner. At the peak of the endemic, the pandemic, we were um, roughly three and a half to four hours in queue waiting uh, on, on, on the lines within the, the, within the system to try to offer assistance to patients about where to get tested, what you know, all the various questions that these, these w patients did have. And so the, the students actually set up an additional phone bank and they manned it uh, 12 hours a day from seven in the morning till seven in the evening, seven days a week. And within one week's time, the three and a half hour wait in queue went down to under 10 minutes. We're very proud of their accomplishments during this particular time. They were a huge resource for us. They're constantly looking for things to do to assist their patients and to assist those that are providing the care and teaching them. Thank you very much, Tamika and Ron, for that wonderful overview. And I'd also just um, let the attendees know, we actually recorded uh, some webinars a, a few weeks ago. One was students who had helped to set up that um, call center to address the, the wait times for patients calling in. And so they talked about their experience in helping set that up. And they also talked more broadly about their experience of being students in this program. And then more recently, we did a webinar again with some Oshner students who are involved in some of the community outreach programs in New Orleans. So I encourage you to refer to our website because we are recording those webinars and they're available for you and for your students to view if you want more information. I would also say, I would like to add also, Cecile, that during that period of time, the varied activities that the students were engaged in and assisting us during the height of the pandemic, the majority of those have actually gone to manuscript and have been submitted in various journals throughout the United States. Um, we've had some accepted already. Um, we expect to have a lot more because their experience and what they wrote about was very genuine, very cutting edge, very innovative, which I think is a very good word to use when you're thinking about our partnership and our program. It's a very innovative medical education program. Thank you, Ron. That's great to know. Um, the next question is about financial aid, asking if there is any financial aid available beyond loans. I'm happy to talk about it from the UQ perspective. So there is no institutional financial aid. This is again another uh, significant difference between Australian universities and US universities. It's not common at all for Australian universities to have institutional financial aid available to their students. 
So Australian students, um, their tuition fees are subsidized by the Australian government who fund um, you know, publicly, public universities like the University of Queensland. And so the, the federal government's position is that all international students to Australia are full fee paying students. Um, and so students are required to pay the, the cost of the, the program. I might also add that uh, in early January this year, when we were rolling out all our goals for, for 2020, um, we launched what were called the Auctioner Scholars Program. And that was going to be um, uh, tuition paid for years three and four when they were in New Orleans, provided that they chose a residency in primary care and that they stayed here at Auctioner to, to do their residency. Uh, they could go elsewhere to do their residency, but what we wanted was them to come back and work with the, within the Oxford system for a minimum of two years. Uh, unfortunately, as a result of the pandemic and the, the financial issues that have impacted us all, uh, those have been pulled off the table for this year, but we hope to be able to go back to those in 21 and definitely in 22. Thank you, Ron. The next question is asking if a car is necessary in Australia for attending classes or clinical activities. And we already touched on that. A car is not required. Um, the the St. Lucia UQ campus and the um, clinical units where students will go for clinical skills coaching, they are all accessible through public transport. In fact, there's the same bus line that goes to all of those um, sites. Um, so it's not necessary to have a car and I, I would um, just remind our U.S. colleagues in Australia we drive on the left hand side of the road so I think public transport is probably the best way to go when you're a new student in Australia and dealing with all of the other differences um, coming down under. Um, the next but in, the, in New Orleans you do need to have a car. It is better for the students and their safety because of the hours that they work and sometimes we have satellite places that they'll need to go to. So we do say our students have to have a car. Thank you, Tamika. Um, the next question is about lectures. Are lectures prior to Corona done online or in person? I would say prior to Corona, the, there was a mix of both, probably more in person than virtual. Uh, as a result of Corona, pretty much everything has gone to virtual in the past three months. But right now, as we look forward to the next six months, we're looking again at a blend of the two and hoping to create some sort of normalcy with, of course, keeping in mind masking, social distancing, decreased density in certain places, et cetera. Um, but I think it will, it will be a blend before the end of this year. Thank you. We have another question about financial aid. Is there any financial aid for international students who are not U.S. citizens? So UQ, um, again, as I mentioned, we don't have institutional financial aid. We do provide um, any administrative support that is required for students who are coming in on some form of an international scholarship. So, so many international students are able to access international scholarships, um, but we, we actually don't have any institutional financial aid. Uh, the next question is about evaluating applicants. Do you evaluate applicants on the basis of their extracurricular activities, research, community service, shadowing, etc.? We do not. Um, we have evaluation based on your GPA, MCAT, and MMI. And what is the um, the opportunity that the applicants have to discuss those things are within the MMI and the uh, questions that are asked. So they can bring those up at that time. We don't have a separate evaluation of those components. Um, we also have another question about MMI, just asking for more information. So to make, do you maybe just want to expand on, on the MMIs that we offer? So the multiple mini interview is a way for applicants to be evaluated more fairly because they get to be seen by more than just one person. The structure is that an applicant will read a scenario and when we were in person, they'd go in the room, they'd speak to the interviewer and they would be scored based on that answer. They would then go to the next room and they would have a succession of eight stations. So there are multiple questions that are asked, multiple scenarios, and multiple interviewers that have the opportunity uh, to, to meet the applicant. 
Thank you. We have a question now about recommendation letters. One of the requirements for recommendation letters is a pre-med committee letter rec rec recommended. We do not use recommendation letters. We go by the MMI, the um, MCAT, and GPA. And it's an interesting you know, issue, I think, Tamika, because again, it is a different process from most US medical schools. And I think um, you know, from the discussions that I've seen on the NAAHP listserv that I participate in, you know, it's lots of discussions around things that we don't actually require. Um, and I, you know, I think one of the, there's a couple of reasons why our, our um, application process is different. I think first of all, you know, we don't require um, recommendation letters or uh, you know recognition of extracurricular activities for our Australian students, and so we need to have this, a similar process for our international applicants. I also think that we don't have the volume of applications that a lot of U.S. Med medical schools would have, and I think that's because we're we're attracting a particular kind of student here. There's been a lot of discussion about resiliency for, for prospective medical students over the last few months with everything, the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had, you know, not just on the application process, but on life in general. And I think in particular, the kind of student that is interested in our program is a student that has already demonstrated high levels of resilience and interest in doing something, you know, that's a little bit different from, from the norm. And so, um, you know, we, we don't have thousands of applications, you know, we're, we're, we don't need sort of the same selection tools that a lot of US med schools utilize in order just to get through the volume of applications that they receive. Would, would that be something that, that you would agree with? Definitely, and Cecile, I would also like to let our audience know that when it comes down to the three components that are necessary for admission, the MCAT represents 25%, the GPA represents 25%, and the MMI represents 50%. So the MMI is heavily weighted in our selection process. Again, we're looking for those independent folks, the self-starters, the resilient folks that you talked about. We're able to, to, to document those and to tease those out through the MMI process religiously. So we, we put a lot of faith in that process of interviewing our students utilizing this technique. Tamika, would you like to add anything? I, I agree with Ron. I think what our program allows for is the applicant who has maybe had a different path in life. And so they didn't know from the first day of freshman year that they wanted to be a doctor. And they may have learned later. And so as a result, they may not have all of the connections with the pre-med advisor, but they're able to be a self-starter and take the MCAT and do all the things that we need in order to move forward. So I think we attract a different type of applicant. I think you're right. And I think the student that sort of gets the most out of the Australian experience in particular are the students who are open to all of the new, you know, different things that they're going to experience, particularly during the first two years. Um, Tanika, we've got another question about MMIs, uh, asking whether you can provide any tips or suggestions for preparation for the MMI. The biggest tip is do not prepare. Um, what they find is that people who try to practice and prepare, they score less, they, they're not natural. And so what you can do to prepare for MMI is to read about what's going on in medicine. What are the hot topics? What are the issues of concern? You can learn about patient care and patient advocacy. There are gonna be things that people talk about wherever you go. You can think about what is your answer to the question, why do I wanna do this? You know, this is a basic question and it's going to come up in traditional interviews it's going to come up in some way in the MMI but our biggest advice is to be natural you can practice communicating answering questions for other people just to get comfortable with timed answers but actually trying to rehearse it makes it unnatural it makes it uh, the applicant uncomfortable when they speak and so we ask that you not try to rehearse the whole situation you just get comfortable answering questions maybe with family and friends that are time, so you can figure out how to compose your thoughts in a short period. I also think this year with the virtual interviews that will be going on for, for residency selection, um, it's not going to be like in the past where you go in and you talk to the program director or the chair and you tell them how great you are and how wonderful his program is or her program is and that you, you know, just 
you would you would, you'd give your firstborn to be in that particular residency. That's not going to happen this year with virtual interviewing. As a matter of fact, they need to be semi-structured or maybe go as far as an MMI. I could see a lot of virtual interviewing this year where the questions uh, emanate around the core competencies in, in GME. Uh, so, you know, resident applicants should know what the six core competencies are and what they mean and how they might need to detail those through the course of interviewing for residencies this year. Thank you both. Uh, we have another question asking if students need to submit all MCAT scores if the test is taken more than once. It's not necessary. Um, we are able to assess an older MCAT score if that, that meets our minimum. We don't necessarily assess on the most recent MCAT score. And I know there's a lot of nervousness from prospective students around getting the highest score. As I said, we, we set our minimum at 504. Ron has mentioned that is worth 25% of your overall admissions score, but really the, the minimum MCAT score is the requirement to be eligible to attend the MMI, um, or with this change now that we will invite based on, on the meeting the minimum GPA requirement, and then we would simply need the uh, 504 MCAT score or higher in order to be eligible for a full offer. So students don't need to submit all their MCAT scores. We just need a score that has been taken within the last four years that meets our 504 minimum. Tamika or Ron, did you want to add anything? So what, we have another uh, question, if we have time. Can we speak briefly about the, inter the application process for international students who are completing undergraduate degrees in the US? Um, so this would be non-U.S. students. It's actually very, very similar um, in that uh, we still have the same MCAT score requirements or uh, and GPA minimum requirements. We are doing virtual MMIs for those applicants as well. Um, and the first round of MMIs for that intake will be in July. Um, but we also have information that's available um, on, our, on our website. Um, another question about, um, is it possible to be offered an MMI without the MCAT score? And, and as I've detailed, yes, because of the um, delays with, with the test dates, the cancellations that happened, and the fact that some students may not be able to sit MCAT until later in the year, we will be assessing applicants, um, and based on their cumulative GPA, we will invite them to attend the MMI. If they successfully um, attend the MMI, we would issue them with a conditional offer. The offer will not become unconditional until we receive an MCAT score that meets our minimum of 504. And students also need to provide confirmation that they have a test date for the MCAT before we would invite them to the MMI. My colleague um, who's assisting with the webinar has just sent the, the link um, on our website about information for international students um, who want, want to apply to UQ. Look, we have a couple more minutes, um, so I thought I might just ask Tamika and Ron if there's any final comments that you'd like to provide to this group about the, about the program. I think um, for me, I have enjoyed seeing the type of student who comes to uh, UQ Oshner. They're brave. They are willing to take the chance and move all the way to Australia. They are the type of students who are interested in participating in research, interested in participating in patient care opportunities. And so the one thing I can say, um, just working with them, I'm a rheumatologist as a physician, I see the quality and I'm able to compare them to other students from other programs and they come ready to see patients with the early exposure to patient care, which gives them confidence and they're able to function as soon as they arrive. So I think any student who goes through this program will be able to be successful as a physician. I think one of the sources of joy for me is the fact that we have taken students into the cohort. They've completed all four years of, of, of their degree. They've graduated. They've gone into residencies here or elsewhere, and they've come back to work for us in our system, and they're exemplary physicians. They do not, they do not just survive. They're thriving here. They're doing extremely well. This is a great environment for them. We're always happy to have them come back and work with us.
Thank you, Ron and Tamika, and thank you to everyone who's attended today's webinar. Um, we will be recording the webinar, and so it will be available on our website shortly. And so please feel free to share um, the link and the information with your colleagues, with prospective students. Um, we're continuing our, our series of webinars to speak to, directly to students about different aspects of the program. Your students are also able to um, book a one-on-one -on -one student counseling session. So with a member of the enrollment management team, either here at UQ or, or based in New Orleans. And we can also arrange for them to talk to a, a current student in the program so they can get that student perspective. So any, any questions, please feel free, free to reach out to us. Thank you very much for your time and thank you very much, Ron and Tamika. Good evening.